It's a great pleasure for me then to ask Thomas Docker to present the 2013 Grantham Annual Lecture. So we are living in the Anthropocene and obviously because this is a new epoch we look at indicators that are unprecedented in the sense that they show values uh, that we haven't seen for a long time. For example, this curve here, the carbon dioxide concentrations reconstructed from Antarctic ice cores over the past 800,000 years show to us natural fluctuations that are in pace with the ice age cycles. There were eight roughly ice age cycles over the past 800,000 years. And I've attached to this curve the observations of the past 60 years, direct measurements from Mauna Loa and many other stations of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And we realize here that 2013 was actually the first year during which at some period the concentration of carbon dioxide exceeded 400 parts per million. Now if you compare that to the concentrations that we measure over the past 800,000 years, then we can make the statement, a statement of fact that today's concentrations are 30% higher than ever during the past 800,000 years. This is an unprecedented um, fact, an unprecedented observation of um, a measurement in the atmosphere. The chemical composition of the atmosphere was changed by the emission of greenhouse gases caused by the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation and a little fraction through cement production. If you look at a shorter time scale, and here I show you the emissions of greenhouse gases as reported and collected by the International Energy Agency, also these emissions are unprecedented in human history. They've increased from about 5.5 gigatons of carbon per year to almost 10 gigatons per carbon uh, carbon per year in the year 2012, where today at 9.7, unprecedented and an interesting observation is that since the legendary Rio conference in 1992, this emission has increased by 57%. Why am I referring to Rio 1992? Because arguably this uh, is a time point where you can say confidently that the world has known about the problems. The policymakers have known about the problems. Otherwise, they wouldn't have convened this conference. And yet, the emissions have increased by 57%, writing every year almost a record emission value. You see uh, around 2009, the effect of the financial crisis and the actual very quick recovery with respect to fossil fuel emissions. Let me now come to what is in this report, the report that was launched on September 27, 2013, after a huge effort of the scientific community. It's important to remind ourselves what the task of IPCC is, this intergovernmental panel on climate change that was founded in 1988. And in our procedures, it's written that our task is to assess on a comprehensive, objective, open and transparent basis the scientific information relevant to understanding scientific basis of risk of human-induced climate change. About 10 gigatons of carbon per year are emitted by human activity. Make the statement in the summary for policymakers that limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, what does that mean? I show you in this table the four emission scenarios and the assessment of the likelihood to exceed 
the two temperature targets that are defined in the documents of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The 1.5 degree Celsius target is likely to be exceeded by all emission scenarios but the lowest one. The 2 degree target is likely to be exceeded by the two larger emission scenario, one being the business as usual, the 8.5, and one a high stabilization scenario, RCP 6.0. For the second lowest emission scenario, there is actually a sizable chance that we also exceed the two degree target. We say more likely than not, which means more than 50%. So many models are compatible with the two degree, but a majority of the models is not. So you see, there's essentially only one scenario that provides us with a possibility to stay below two degrees, and that is RCP 2.6. And I now can use the concept of cumulative emissions, which is nothing else than the area under this curve, to relate that to the chosen target. I take here a scenario that is compatible with the two degree target, and the prediction from this academic scenario is that from 2020 onwards you have to reduce by over 3% per year your emissions. If you instead decide to wait a decade and have to peak in emissions only in 2030, in order to achieve the same amount of cumulative emissions, you have to go down at a steeper rate, 5.8% <clears throat> per year. And you can continue this exercise Another decade tells you that you have to reduce by almost 20%. And it turns out that there is actually a very simple relationship between what we call the mitigation delay sensitivity of the climate system, the time derivative of peak warming, and the peak warming itself. It's simply connected by the rate of emission increase between now and the time of peaking emissions. You can now work out in numbers how big that sensitivity is and it's quite instructive to look at this relationship. It suggests an exponential relationship between um, uh, for this peak temperature. Peak temperature peak warming rises at the rate of emissions. And we can actually show that in a graph where you see again uh, time on the horizontal, the emissions uh, on the vertical, the observed emissions up to the year uh, 2012 here with these uh, diamonds. And then basically an assumption of 2.4% per year reduction at various peaking times with the indication of the peak warming that you get. And as you wait, this warming goes up. Uh, we can even work out the rate by comparing that rate to the rate of the observed warming. For example, in the 20th century, we observe a rate of warming of 0 0.08 degrees Celsius per decade. In the latter part of the 20th century and the past 12 years, 0 0.12 degrees Celsius per decade. Uh, the warming pause, some people call it, 0 0.05 degrees Celsius per decade. This one here, the, increased, the increase of peak warming is much faster, 0.4 degrees Celsius per decade. So a decade of negotiations and waiting for implementation of emissions reduction costs you about half a degree Celsius of your climate target. Now that is, I believe, a very policy relevant statement. Committed peak warming rises by a factor of three to eight uh, the uh, faster than the observed warming. Let me close with showing you the world according to these climate models for 
the lowest emission scenario and the highest one, RCP 2.6, equivalent CO2 concentration by the end of the 21st century, 475 ppm. This is temperature change relative to the end of the 20th century and below precipitation change. The world is warming. Precipitation changes are hard to actually see. There is a lot of area that is showing this hash pattern, which indicates that the model simulations show changes in precipitation that are not distinct from the natural variability in the climate system today. But they are there, the changes are there. In the business as usual scenario, the world looks quite different. The colors are more intense, indicating larger warming. A world that has a global mean warming of over four degrees Celsius with enhanced warming over the continents and over the high northern latitudes with a warming there exceeding seven degrees Celsius in the annual mean. But what is really concerning is the fact that also precipitation now shows large changes. You see areas where there is significantly more precipitation, 40 to 50 percent more precipitation in certain areas of the tropics and the high latitudes of the northern hemisphere. But more disturbing areas where we have reductions in these model simulations of precipitation by 20 to 30 percent, for example, in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean area and the subtropical areas, both areas that already today are challenged by water shortage. So to me, this is really a signal that we not only have to look at the warming, which by itself is a challenge through its implication of changing extreme events and sea level rise, etc., but it's the primary resource of humankind and ecosystems, water, that will change substantially in these high emission scenarios. Let me summarize. These are the three most important headline statements out of Working Group 1 contribution to AR5. And from these considerations that I've shown um, at, uh, in the second part, these climate targets actually disappear rapidly as, climate, as carbon dioxide emissions continue. We need to be honest to ourselves. A two degree target may be an option today but in a few years, it won't be an option any longer. Committed peak warming increases at rates similar to those of the emission increase, three to eight times faster than the observed warming. 